back again. Bats and Stats presented by ScoutStatline.com. Myself, Brian, as always, and my cohort, Ross R. Jensen. Ross, how are we doing tonight, buddy? <laughs> I'm good. Had a really busy last half week or so. A lot of new stuff at Scout the Stat Line, as we kind of covered in the last episode. Uh, burning the candle at both ends. I've just been exhausted, but I'm I'm starting to feel a little re-energized, so I'm ready to go. Let's let's go and get this thing. Okay, so tonight we got uh, some pretty exciting stuff. We've been like what Ross was saying is we've been burning the candle at both ends. We we got some spoilers coming, some little tiny spoilers, and uh, and then we're gonna hit some a couple guys that I picked out of uh, Scott Statline's leaderboards. Uh, pretty excited about, and then we're gonna jump into some fun historical comps. Probably my favorite part of Scout the Stat Line is the historical comps because it just kind of puts a reflection on some of these guys. And obviously, we don't know if they're going to be those guys, but it, it's fun to see random names pop up. And a couple of them on here I really, really like. They are really, really good comps. Uh, but before we get into any of that, we have to do um, what is going to become the most popular part, part of the pod in my opinion. And that's the beer of the pod. Beer, beer of the pod. pod. And I'm going to go first because I always make you go first. And I'm always like, oh, I'm going to switch it up and let Ross go first. Now, no, I'm going to go first tonight. And I'm going to do this little little spiel right here. Salmon Made in Montana. Yeah. So this is Salmon Fly Honey Rye. And I've had this beer quite a bit. This comes out of the Madison River Brewing Company in Montana. Yeah, Salmon Fly Honey Rye. It's a great name, by the way. Anytime you can rhyme something, that's a great rhyme. It's a great rhyme or a great time? Both. <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, and then I have a cup. Uh, we go to Deadwood quite a bit. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Deadwood or anything like that, but um, we go to cool August nights in Deadwood, gambling, cars, Pretty good stuff. There we go. And I didn't get any hit on it. God. <laughs> I'm going to be all bubbly now. Very powerful. Very strong flavor. Um, it does have a little writing on the back. And I'll say the annual salmon fly hatch occurs in early summer on the Madison River. In recognition, Madison River Brewing Company presents Salmon Fly Honey Rye, the malted barley used in this unique brew is complemented by the subtle spiciness of rye. Bittering or yeah, bittering in flavor op additions balance the sweetness from the hint of pure Montana honey to complement a Delightful drinking experience. It's really hard to read. It's it's been like cursive, but it, like it's just really hard to read. And then it, with a rounded uh, salmon fly, the one on today. It's good. It's a good beer. All right, I like it. I like it. Yeah, local flavor. Okay. Yeah. Here's my beer. This one's called minimalist let's see if i can get a good angle here minimalist bane that's a skeleton on there dancing around with a bottle that has three x's on it it says down here man can give up everything in life but this ipa and fantasy baseball <laughs> and fantasy baseball yeah so this <laughs> is in fact an ipa it says this dry hopped English style IPA offers plenty of golding hops to convey a floral and delicate nose, while two row and crystal malts keep this traditional English style IPA well balanced. This one's coming out of McCall, Idaho. So I'm going yeah. pretty local as well. So I'm going to give her a pot and a pour. I'm cute. I, I, I'm a little bit curious about your Idaho beers. Um, are they all huge like this? No, I, I, I go to the co-op usually when I'm 
picking something out for this. And they just have a lot of these specialty beers. And I just go to a certain section that, that tends to be the big singles. Um, generally they got all sorts of stuff. I, I could go with the smaller regular cans, but I'm, I'm just trying to check out something unique. You know, did I say who this was from McCall Brewing Company? Yeah. yeah. Out of McCall. Yeah. All right, let's give it a try. It's a it's a darker IPA as you can see. Um and definitely maltier. I'm almost surprised that this is not a double IPA given how malty it is. Yeah, and only 6.7%. It's good. It is a little unique with that that heavy malty flavor as opposed to a very hoppy strong IPA that you typically get especially in this area so I enjoy it and I would definitely recommend you check it out let's dive into it man okay so um spoiler alert doo -doo 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 -doo. spoiler alert scout stat line is going to have its first mid-season top 100 prospects it's probably going to come out before this pod does so um i i know it, i'm saying spoiler alert but if you're already in the discord you will see it there in fact i already teased my top 50 my top 100 is ready to go i might make some refinements before the list goes out which is thursday by the way thursday the first sts consensus top 100 list is coming out it's going to be it's going to be big. Um, and then also the dynasty guru is working on re-ranking of all their, their positional lists. Yep. I don't know about you, Brian, but I know my rankings are going to feed directly into that too. So it's like, I'm not gonna, it's like killing two birds with one stone. I got, we're doing a top 100 at STS and then dynasty guru is usually top by position. Um, they're, they're going to be doing all major league and, and minor league. So there's going to be, some extra work to do of course but yeah absolutely yeah and uh, this is going to be the first annual for dynasty gurus doing a mid-season as well yeah yeah a lot of big so, stuff and this stuff is all going to go out into that discord too so yes. get on there yeah. even if yeah. you're even if you're going through dynasty guru instead of scout the stat line you're probably going to see all the scout the stat line rankings too so just an added extra little benefit there is there anything you'd like to throw a spoiler out there on your top 100. Um, I know I have a couple of that I'm a little bit, um, I even had a tough time, you know, I, actually I had a massively tough time doing my ranking because I had my personal beliefs. Um, and then I, you know, I, I kind of want to follow the industry a little bit. Um, and I did, um, but there was a lot in there that I, I was switching and, and going like, I, I really like this guy. Um, I'd like to move this guy up higher. I, I did a lot of jumbling, um, a lot of mixing and matching. Um, so it, it looks good. I'm pretty satisfied with it. The top, uh, the top 50 were a heck of a lot easier than the bottom 50. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. You know, it's interesting when you're doing rankings because I, I ended up doing some things that I didn't think prior to going into it that I would, I would have done. Um, and that's mostly just because you do a lot of internal debate, right? And there are some guys that, you know, I, over the years, maybe I built or over the last year or two years hasn't been forever. Obviously these guys haven't been around for that long, but you kind of build up these, these biases as you were saying like certain things like certain players and so i try to i try to omit that as much as i can yeah and stick to the the rationality and the logic like what reason would i have for putting this guy above this guy if there is no reason then i'm not going to do it i'm going to i'm going to take the the logical position and and go with that i'm I'm pretty happy with the top end of my my rankings. I think you get into the lower end, and that's where it gets a lot trickier. Because um, yeah. there's a lot of guys that I wanted to make my top 100 that I just couldn't quite rationalize getting them in a position up there. 
and I probably ranked about 140 some guys all told, but I only really fine tuned the top 100 because yeah. that's, that's what our goal was is to have 100. So those other 40 guys that I wanted, you know, they just didn't quite find a spot. Some things that I would like to highlight from it. One of the guys that I really like, and I, I tweeted about him earlier in this year, I own him where I can. And in our home league that we play together, I own him. Edward Julian didn't come in as high as I thought he would after I did all my all my rankings. He's still number 26, so he's not low by any means, but I thought I would have him a little bit higher uh, when it came down to it. Who else do I want to highlight? Everybody knows that I love Adele Amador. I have him way higher than STS. It's Ross versus the machine on that one. I've got him at number 14 on my list. I, I just am going to continue having him climb until he's number one. It's going to happen. Jackson Chorio yeah. fell a little bit for me. Junior Caminero made a very large leap. And he was already pretty highly ranked by me coming into the season. I think I had him in the 30s. So if I'm saying he made a large leap, he's pretty high up there. And then everybody knows who my number, my personal number one is, so I don't need to beat that one. Oh, a guy I want to talk about today. If we get a chance, I want to I want to insert him into our lineup here. Luis Matos. I have him at number 18 overall. Big news tonight. And, Big news tonight. And he got the call tonight. And I interestingly enough. I was just on Twitter just before we did this and prospect tilt had said he he's a top 10 prospect. And I was like, Whoa, that's bold, man. That's bold. I had him at 18. So I was, I, I as far as I knew, that was the most aggressive ranking of Luis Matos that existed up until I heard he was top 10 from prospect tilt. So, you know, maybe I have to move him up before Thursday. I don't know. Yeah. But I've tried to go get him. I've tried to go get him. Yeah. I also had uh, Amador, but uh, he, he came in at number 20 for me. Uh, but he did make my top 20. Uh, I'm I'm an Amador fan. A um, couple other little highlights. Colt Keith. Man, I love Colt Keith. Yep. Really high. And I just, I could not move him down. Where'd you put him? He is at one, two, three, four, five. He came in at eleven. It's pretty good. I have him at thirteen, so we're yeah. we're on the same wavelength. Okay, Colt Keith came in really high. Christian Incart Incarnacion Strand uh, came in at fourteen. Yeah, he's a tricky one for me because there's a lot of red flags there, but you cannot just ignore a guy that's yeah. slugs Love like he guy. does, and he has been doing it for a long time now. Yeah, so love that guy. And then um, just a couple other players that I don't think anybody else has them on their list, but I, I'm just a huge fan of. I have planted my flag on these four individuals: AJ Vukovic, How Yu Lee, Kai Bush, and Nico Kavadas. They all made my top 100. Who is your top pitcher? My top pitcher is still Painter. Okay. And I, he, he's actually number three. I have him at number seven on my list, which was the same I had him at this preseason. So he's in the same position anyway. Okay. Um, anyone that you moved up from the pitching ranks, that was a surprise? Um, Yeah. And I think uh, uh, a couple of our um, fellow STSers, are really, really high on him, but Bobby Miller is really high. Yeah. Okay. And there's going to be yeah. some, there's going to be a lot of people that um, uh, did our rankings that have Bob, Bobby Miller massively high. And I'm not going to shout their names out right now, but let's just say that he's top 10 for a couple people. Wow. Yeah. That is saying something. Yeah. Uh, so, I moved Emmett Sheehan pretty high. I don't think that that's a surprise, really. People know that I've been interested in Sheehan. So he made a large jump for me. And Yuri Perez, uh, who 
is a fantastic prospect. Probably I was way too low on coming into this year because he was ever one of everybody's top guys, but I've moved him way up because he showed a lot this year. And then he's gone in into the, the big leagues and he's continued to be dominant yep. at 20 years old. So he's, he's gone it, way up. He's right behind painter for me. Yeah. Yeah. I have him top 15. Uh, I also have another bit. This was probably a recency biased, but I have Andrew Abbott in the top 25. And that's a recency biased. I know it is. I, I've seen what he's been doing, and it, that's what popped him up my list. I, if this would have happened a month ago, Andrew Abbott would not be this high, but he is lighting things up. Yeah, no, I'm okay with it. I've got him in my top 35. Yeah. Just a little bit lower than you. He's at number 34 overall for me. But yeah, it, it, what about the guys it, that we covered last week? I'm curious. Did any of those guys make your top 100? The three mustached fellows. Yeah, uh, two Wade of them. Furman, Wade Meckler, and um, Ignacio Alvarez. I don't think Alvarez did. Let me take a look. I think he was one of my omits that I was really upset about. Um, but yes, Furman came in and Meckler came in. Uh, Meckler is about... 10 spots higher than Furman. It's interesting because yeah, yeah. when, when I was first, when I was first, and same for me, Alvarez did not make yeah. my top 100. When I was first looking at those three gentlemen and, <laughs> and wanting to talk about them, uh, I had this ordering probably the opposite. Well, not quite. I had Alvarez as my top of those three and now he didn't quite make my top 100 and Meckler I, I had the lowest because I was just a little skeptical of some of those those performance numbers I have him at number 87 I you know what I like those guys I, I like do. contact <laughs> first players and I think they just get overlooked um, and the reason that he's in my top 100 he might not be as flashy as some of the guys that most people are going to have in their top 100s over him but I think he's got as much, if not more, of a chance of being a successful pro. Uh, and then Nate Furman I've got at number 69. And then uh, I, I, one guy that I think you want to hit on um, just a little bit, it, I've seen you post about him here and there, and you mentioned something in uh, our Slack conversation, is Sung Chi Chang. Yeah. Yeah. He's just so underrated. Yeah. And still flying, even under my radar, as I was like going through this, looking at rankings, I think I have him too low. I might have to move him up by Thursday because I think I got him too low. Um, right now, he's at number 74. Too low. He's too low, Brian. I got to move him up. He's going to go up. He's moving up. That's funny. I have him at 74, too. Yeah, well, <laughs> things change, you know. I, I did this about a week ago, and it's already different. That's the power of STS, right? Yeah. You don't have to wait for our rankings releases. Love it. I love it. You you guys are going to enjoy it. So please, if it's going to be free, then obviously look at it. But if it's not going to be free, maybe you're going to have to pony up a little bit of cash to see what's going on in our in our scouting world. So the way that this is going to work at Scout the Stout Line, when you see these consensus rankings, is you'll see a list of all of the different STS contributors and their rankings. And then the front column of that list will be the overall average rate rating ranking of those players. So it's going to be really helpful. You're not just looking at one person's rankings here. You got a list of them. So there's going to be probably personalities that you agree with more and you'll be able to take a look at what they think. Um, and then you get a nice balanced overall ranking. So it's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I, I'm excited to see who was omitted and who, would, uh, you know, made the, the top 100s. There's going to be, you know, a, I, I'm probably going to be the only one that have like AJ Vukovic on there, but really high on the guy. So um, 
Yeah, maybe we can do like a min max column too, like who had them the highest, who had them the lowest. Sure, sure. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm excited. I'm excited to see it. So I would hope that everybody else is as well. So uh, sure. with that, uh, we got two guys I want to talk about tonight. I was going through the um, STS uh probability and not probability rankings but sts model um and i found two guys that i was really interested in so first off we're going to hit on adrian pinto adrian pinto is with the single a affiliate with the toronto blue jays he is five foot six 156 pounds he is 20 years old he was an international signee um first thing i want to touch on with pinto is he has seven 70 stolen bases in his minor league career so far. That's 429 at bats. He has 70 stolen bases. His overall average is 291. His on per base percentage is 427. And he, he's not a power guy. That, that's not why we're looking at him. His slugging percentage is only 420. He has five career home runs in, in 429 at bats, um, 20, uh, 24 doubles and eight triples. Uh, you know, those can turn into to home runs, but that's not what we're expecting from him. This is a straight up speed guy, and this is a straight up on base machine. He has 84 walks in his career and only 75 strikeouts. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything on Pinto? Is he a guy that you're targeting that you're really watching? So when when Pinto came up, he actually was signed by the Rockies and traded to the Blue Jays. But he, that that first year in the DSL, he put up lights out numbers. Yep. And he was one of those guys that was a little troubling for our, our single season data systems because he was just filling up the, the, he was just filling up the leaderboard. He was filling up the box scores and he was a, he, he was a troubling guy. Um, according to the statistics there, it was like a speed machine, 41 yep. stolen bases and not even half a season of plate appearances, 224 plate appearances. You extrapolate that. That's he's like a hundred stolen base guy. Um, he was hitting for decent power there. He was 18 years old at the time. Great plate discipline. He was one of those guys that kind of throws it for the, for a loop. And this is again, why you get, I don't, it's hard to trust DSL statistics. He was placed in single A last year. Numbers came down predictably, but he, I was watching him really closely because of the, that DSL performance. So he dropped quite a bit in the STS system, and he was a riser again this year early on in the season, even though the power has not come around at all. But his plate discipline has gotten really strong. The words of warning here is he's repeating single A and his numbers have actually taken a dip overall. He's hurt right now. And so I think part of that is, is injury driven and, and it's still a fairly small sample in the season overall. So he continues, it gets back in and he's healthy and he's continuing to hit. We'll see those rise again. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right on the money. I think the blue Jays saw something in this guy. That's why they went out, acquired him. That was prior to the 2022 season start, by the way. So right after that DSL year, which I'm kind of surprised that the, the Rockies were willing to part with him. Um, but it's it's still kind of a wait and see because this is the kind of profile. He's a small guy, mm -hmm. but like an Altuve, like you, maybe you see some power develop in a guy like this. He's got excellent plate discipline. He's got some speed. If he can, if he can get that piece added into his game, he's a, you know, he's an impact player. If he doesn't, he might still be an all right player from the on base, hitting, and stealing bases perspective. I don't know if the, those stolen bases are going to translate quite as well at like the professional level. Right now, he kind of looks like a poor man's Nate Furman to me. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Um... One thing that I know you say this quite a bit is the last thing that develops is power. I mean, it, he's got his average isn't massively high right now, but he is so patient with that baseball, man. 
he, you know, like I said, it, his average this year is 247 and 97 at bats, but his on base percentage is 402. Yeah. He only has 25 strikeouts and 22 walks. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive for a 20 year old in, in a ball. And he comes back and starts swinging the bat by the end of the year. It probably high a, but I mean, if he sees double A, that's pretty impressive. Yep, absolutely. I, I like it. I, I like this profile quite a bit. Yeah, there's potential here. This is the kind of profile that often gets slept on, but yeah. there's something there underneath the numbers. Yeah. Um, but you got to see it first, right? Oh, yeah. You can't just rely on it being there. This is a guy that I'm watching right now with intrigue to see to see what happens. Um Nobody thought Jose Altuve was a worthwhile prospect either. And I know I beat this drum all the time, but very there's a lot of similarities here. Um, Altuve was a guy that could put the bat on everything. He had great plate, plate discipline, great plate approach. He was probably a little bit better. He was a better hitter than, than what we're seeing right now from, from Pinto. But he developed power later. In fact, he didn't even really develop power until he was a professional. So, but by the time he was graduating from the minor leagues, all of a sudden he was hitting 400 in minor league ball, and everybody was still kind of like, "Yeah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna play in the in the major leagues." Sure enough, it did, and now he's like a 30 home run guy too. So, yeah. So yeah, everybody keep that on your minds. Adrian Pinto with the Blue Jays. Next guy, um, once again, it, it, I think there was kind of a theme tonight that I was looking for. Uh, and these are more or less Ross's kind of guys. And th these are guys that can control the strike zone. They know when to swing the bat and they know when not to. Uh, the next one is Terrell Tatum. And Terrell Tatum is with the high A affiliate with the Chicago White Sox. He is five foot nine, 167 pounds. He's 23 years old, a little bit older um, than what we're looking for in high A, but that's okay because this, this profile is going to play. He has overall in his career, 387 at bats. He has, he has batted 258. His on base percentage is 425. That is 109 strikeouts, or I'm sorry, 144 strikeouts to 109 walks. He has seven home uh, seven home runs overall, three triples, 29 um, doubles, and his slugging percentage is 403. So once again, the, the power numbers aren't with these two fellas. Um, we're looking at straight on base percentages and stolen bases. He has 51 stolen bases in 387 at bats. What do we got on Terrell Tatum, Ross? Oh, you're right. I mean, I think you, you kind of nailed it with him. You have to wonder if he's passive to a fault because in 228 plate appearances this season, he's either walked or he struck out in 111 of plate appearances. <laughs> that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of plate appearances where he's not ending that play with the ball in play. Um, that's almost half. Yeah. So probably that that's questionable. Like you probably are going to need to get a little more aggressive as you get up or those walks might start turning into strikeouts, you know, yep. as people are actually pitching in the zone and hitting corners and making you, making you have to swing in order to, to stay alive. So that's something to watch. Um, a lot of people will talk about this like it's a huge problem being too passive. I don't know that I'm seeing evidence of that really in the major leagues. Like people keep talking about this being a problem for Juan Soto. And we're talking about one of the best players in the major leagues when we're talking about him. So, you know, oh, yeah, it's a huge problem. The other players that aren't swinging, they're pretty good ball players too. So, yeah. so I don't know. It remains to be seen. But I can see that being a bigger issue for a guy that's 23 and high A as he's moving up to double A yeah. and as he's moving up to triple A. So those are things to watch out for, but the speed is absolutely there. He's got a 440 OBP on the year, insanely high, and he's got 28 stolen bases. Again, 
you know, extrapolation is not everything, but we're talking about a guy that could steal 70 bases over the course of the season. So that's yeah. quite a bit of stolen bases. That'll help. That's for sure. Yeah, these these were two guys that I just I I loved what they were doing in their profiles with all the walks. The strikeout numbers were still a little high, but like they were manageable. Um, and their averages were in a decent spot. They just needed, like you were saying, you know, get the bat off your shoulder and swing the bat. But yeah. um, but it, on on the high side of, or on the other side of that is pitchers are going to have to paint those corners with these two guys. Like, yeah. You're going to have to have some really good pitching to get these guys out. Otherwise, they're fine taking a walk, and then they'll you know they're basically turning a walk into a double with all these these solo bases. Uh, on the other side of that, both of these two characters get caught stealing a little too too much, just a little bit too much. But it, it, I think that's, I think they're both speed guys, and the the timing of getting a stolen base is always an issue. You know, it, it, it it's not all speed. You can be a slow guy and still get stolen bases if you have good timing. Depends on how slow you are. But you can't be Daniel Vogelback. <laughs> I was going to say both. Yeah. Vogelback. <laughs> uh, you can't be anyone, you know. <laughs> I didn't mean to throw that name out there, but let's be honest. <laughs> I saw an interesting tweet today that was saying he's a zero tool player. I, I read the same yeah. thing, and that's that's exactly what popped into my mind. With you, you, you can't be that slow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, can we insert another player in here? Yeah, you bet. Who do you want to go with? I want to talk about Luis Matos. Let's do it. So he cracked into my my top 20 in my personal rankings. This guy is not ranking very good on Scout the Stat Line right now. And the big reason for that is he flopped last year really wow. badly. Um, but I want to walk through this guy's profile because to me it's fascinating. And I'm all in. And like I said, at 18 overall in my personal rankings, which I did last week, I might be too low. He's continued to to hit and validate what he's been doing. And so I mean, I might need to bump that up a little bit. So let me walk through this, because this was a guy I really liked just going back two years. I was a, I was a big fan of this guy. I thought he was a, a potential future batting title contender. And I think he's back on course for that. So his first year uh, between DSL and rookie level, he hit 367. Again, so like this is a guy that immediately is on your radar. He was 17 years old. Granted, most of those numbers came in the DSL. But this guy also apparently comes with a really nice stroke. So he he checks the boxes from a scouting perspective as well, which just helps. It helps. Um, he followed that up in 2021 after the after the break. His age 19 season in single A, he hit 313 with a 359 OBP and a 495 slugging percentage. Pretty solid numbers across the board. He sold 21 bases and he hit 15 home runs. So we're not talking about an LA De La Cruz sort of counting stats guy here. But what he does give you is, is he's not striking out very much. He's got a pretty low strikeout percentage, even, even back then. His walk rate isn't very high, but he's a high-volume contact hitter. And he's doing it with pretty good power and pretty good speed. Uh, 2022 came around, and this guy's career took a total turn the wrong direction. Nosedive. Nosedive. But, and this is very similar to Nick York. They're one and the same. They've got the same narrative going on. Uh, took a nosedive, but the caveat was he was it was an injury plagued season, awful season, and filled with bad luck too. And and I could see this looking through the numbers, and I thought he was a potential rebound candidate this year. But I also don't ignore it when things like that happen because I don't know for sure. You know, I can't say for sure if a player is going to rebound from some some poor season like that. But what we did get from him was only a 215 batting average. And, and the thing that stood out to me that was interesting about that is he had similar, there were slightly worse strikeout and walk rates from his walk rate was actually a little bit better. 
his strikeout rate was a little bit worse than than in 2021 um but his results were markedly worse mm-hmm. he was slugging much worse his average plummeted 100 points um his on base percentage plummeted pretty close to the same 90 points 80 points so again he he just kind of fell off everybody's radar after that and it's impossible not to because you can't just ignore a season like that that was at mostly at high a um and then this year he's now 21 he's coming off this injury plague season i don't know what goes into the psyche of a player going through that uh, but he started the year at double A. He was hitting pretty solidly there. And and what is really interesting about the numbers is he walked 17 times and he only struck out 12. So all of a sudden his plate discipline was through the roof good as he moved up a level in his age 21 season. He earned himself a promotion to triple A. Again, he's still just 21 years old. And it's just been lights out been game on ever since triple a he has been unbelievable unbelievable so this was as of yesterday his slash line is 396 with a 434 obp and a 660 slugging percentage that's too low his batting average is now over 400 and he hit another home run tonight and he's getting the call he's getting the call during mid game they took mid game they said yep just pack your bag, bud. Yep, and he's getting the call. So unbelievable ascent through the minor leagues, and if you have a chance to go nab him, I would go take advantage of it. I'm trying to get him in our league. Um, we'll see if it happens. Probably won't, but I'm. you know what I'm doing? I'm writing off last season. I'm not completely ignoring it, but I'm saying that the trajectory I felt like he was on before is the trajectory he was on. And that was just a little road bump. So I moved I moved him into my top 20. He's probably still too low. I like what the the Giants did with him. They were just like, forget about high A, man. Forget about it. It's fine. You're going to double A. Kid lights it up. Screw it. You're going straight to triple A. Lights it up. Screw it. Come on up to the majors. Well, he got lucky, too, because there was an injury that facilitated that as well. Um, otherwise, it would have been a tougher yeah. path. And you hate to see that. You hate to see that when a guy is is mashing in the minor leagues and they just can't get up. Um, or there is a reason why they're held down for whatever purposes or reasons or excuses. Sometimes it's just a bad excuse. Um, so I, I have a, I love it. I have a, a Hawkeye on – Matos right now and the reason I have a Hawkeye on him is the Giants do more with nothing than any other team in the league they turn absolutely nothing into like an all-star so what are they gonna do with the real talent now yeah what are they gonna do with the real talent let's I'm excited and I, I'm just gonna sit here and watch because I'm I'm not gonna be able to go get him I'm glad you added him because I'm glad we talked about that. Uh, yeah. That was, that, that, that was a fun one. Uh, the next little segment that I want to do um, in our podcast tonight is going to be just, just a fun thing that I like to do on STS. Um, and that's the, the historical comps. Uh, if you guys haven't jumped onto the website and looked through the player rankings, they'll have a historical comp next to them. And it, it, it really is one of the funnest things for me to do because it brings up old names, brings up names and guys that um, can really link a player. And a few of these ones on there tonight really link a player for me. Um, I'll, I'll just start right into it. And, and we're going to do Dalton rushing equals Willie Stargell. Do you believe it? Comp. <laughs> leave it. <laughs> I don't. I don't think we're looking at Willie Stargell, but you never know with these guys. And he is mashing in the minor leagues. The thing with the comps, the historical comps, is it's it's intended to be fun and interesting. And for me, I'm always looking for comps. 
I that that's why I built it is is I wanted something that was going to link it up for me. So if I didn't if I wasn't able to come up with something, then I would have something to look at. Um is Dalton rushing going to be Willie Stargell? I don't think so. <laughs> but again, you Let's never hope. you never know. <laughs> STS no. sometimes sees things that I don't. So <laughs> yeah, it, and that's what that's why I brought this list into equation tonight. It, it's it's just really fun. Uh, I love, just I the, love when you're getting the Hall of Fame comps though, because those are yeah. my those are my favorite, and you don't get them very often. Like, no. it, it's interesting. We had the podcast with Ryan, and he was, and he was kind of like, some of these comps I just don't like. I I don't get it. Like, you're that guy's not going to be as good as so and so, and it's like, well, I mean, there's thousands of prospects and they're not getting hall of fame comps it's very rare that you get that nope. you know you get maybe one or two and you're gonna have some of these guys turn into hall of famers probably a handful every year are going to become hall of famers because that's the number of hall of famers that we have go into the hall every year yep. so you never know you never know we got we got one of the best comps i've ever seen for jackson holiday earlier in the year with Rogers Hornsby. No. Oh. And now he just doesn't match up with anyone anymore. But he had yeah. Rogers Hornsby for a little bit. And I was like, whoa, that's a comp. That's a comp you want. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> it's terrific. And, and, and once again, we're we're not saying that these guys are going to turn into them. They they just have something in their profile that is linking them to a random player in the universe. And if you go through all of these guys, you're going to see Anthony Goose. You're going to see um, Denard Spann. You're going to see the, the uh, Desmond Jennings. The correlation engine loves certain players, it seems like. Christian Yelich, he is always on there all the time. Yeah. I, I just don't know why and what rhyme or <laughs> reason there is for it pulling in these certain guys that are there all the time. Sometimes you see them back to back, like yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's just really fun, and, and I hope everybody jumps in there and and just kind of looks at it and and gets a good laugh out of it because it, it, some of them are really funny, and just because there's no no chance, and then other ones it's like, man, I can really see that, and we're gonna get to a couple of them here. Um, one that we're gonna dive into next right now, unless you want to say anything else about uh, adult rushing. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen, but I, I'd love for it to. I'd love for it to. Yeah. The next one is Emmanuel Rodriguez, and he gets a comp of yo man, Jose Canseco. All right. Another so I got to say this because everybody's probably going to, he's probably going to hate, people are probably going to hate me for saying this, but when I was growing up, Jose Canseco was my favorite player. He was the man. <laughs> And, and if you're the same age as me, you know why. Because because this guy was just a superstar. And everybody wanted to be Jose Canseco. Obviously, the narrative changes a little bit over the years. But, yeah, I, I love it. I You know, I'm, I, I still like Jose Canseco just because he's one of those guys I grew up on, you know. <laughs> so, speaking of Jose Canseco, did you read his book? I did not read his book. I don't either. <laughs> I can't imagine that the narrative is top level. I don't know. Yeah, could be yeah, wrong on that. Yeah, I bet it paints a, a glorious Bob Ross picture. Anyway, he, um, Emmanuel Rodriguez usually is drawing a comp on here to Sammy Sosa. So, it, again, those comps update yeah. every day. If something in the numbers triggers something new, then it will it will switch out to a, a new guy. But he had been getting Sammy Sosa quite a bit. So Sammy Sosa, Sammy Sosa and Jose Canseco. Talking about some huge power numbers. Huge power numbers. Power numbers. And hopefully Manuel Rodriguez can find his stroke. His numbers have been getting better. Yeah. Getting better on the season, but they're not quite what they were last year. Next one we got up. It, it, this one was really fun for me. It, when I When I first looked at it, I was like, yeah, I can see that as I as I really started thinking about it, I was like, oh, absolutely. This makes a ton of sense. And that's Christian Carnacion Strand. 
and he gets a comp of J.D. Martinez. And that is perfect. That is exactly what I feel Strand is going to turn out to be. I mean, it would be a great outcome for him. Oh, yeah. J.D. Martinez has had a great career. But you're right. Like he's, favor. he's one of those guys that has found a way to thrive despite poor plate discipline, and you don't find those guys that much. So great prototype and i i hope it does work out like that because that would be fun to watch on this up and coming reds team with a bopper like a jd martinez in the middle of the lineup you know they need that and and i think that it's possible i think we might get that we've we seen a, a a showcase tonight that showed the amount of hits that christian gets outside the zone and it's incredible just Which incredible is I mean, th- there's <laughs> there's two sides to that, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because what, what they're showing in that graphic was that he's a good bad ball hitter. Is he still going to be a good bad ball hitter in the major leagues? That remains to be seen. So there's the risk is, you know, is all of a sudden he going to regress to MLB averages for that? Because that's going to really hurt his numbers yeah. unless he fine tunes that approach so i i think it's it's time let's find out let's find out i agree and and the the reds want it too that team is just loaded full of young talent let's see the rest of them get called up well and i mean geez what what is he slugging this year it's like 770 or something like that yeah it's pretty yeah i think he hit his 17th home run tonight did he hit a home run tonight I believe so. Yeah, I believe it was number 17. Unreal. Prior to tonight, he was hitting, he was slugging 735. So, yeah, yeah insane. Yeah, he's he's going to be fun. Another one that comes up next is going to be Gabriel Gonzalez. And he gets a comp of a name that I, I just don't hear often enough. And I, I love it. Pudge Rodriguez. Do you like that one? <laughs> I think it makes sense uh, because a, a lot of those ratios he could hit with a similar kind of power as as Pudge did, and his walks and his strikeouts would be in the same range. I mean, it, it totally makes sense as I'm looking through the numbers. Uh, one thing that's kind of a knock, or so I have read about Gabriel Gonzalez, is that he's not very athletic. Okay. I don't know if you could say the same for Pudge, but he did have the nickname of Pudge. (laughs) It's fair. (laughs) So, you you know, who knows? Uh, Next one we got Jason Dominguez. And I think this is a really fun comp too, is Hanley Ramirez. Yep. I think that's a really good comp for Jason Dominguez. The Martian gets Hanley Ramirez. I think people forget... How, how good, good Hanley Ramirez was. He was incredible. And how good he was of a prospect when he was coming up, too. He was an incredible prospect. And he won Rookie of the Year. He won a batting title. Hanley Ramirez was kind of the do-it-all guy. He's the prototype that everybody wanted to be uh, when he was first coming up. But the second half of his career wasn't quite the same, and I think that's what people tend to remember. But man, he was a really good player. If that's yeah. an outcome for Jason Dominguez. Oh, people be jumping out of their shoes, man. Yeah. Until they forget about it and, you know, the second half of the <laughs> career occurs, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Would be a, I think that would be something people would be happy about in the first half, though. The next one, uh, the next one just kind of touched my, my fantasy baseball fandom, I guess. Uh, and that's Brainier Banassi. And Brainier Banassi got a comp to Jason Kipnis. And when as soon as I seen Jason Kipnis's name, I, I just got smiles on my face. It, it, he was he was on my fantasy baseball teams um, years and years ago. And he stole bases when people never stole bases. And he was probably the best second baseman 
for a, a handful of years. Uh, Jason Kipp was a reign there for for a little bit where he was quite the asset. Yeah. Yeah, he, he was just a, a real soft spot in my heart was Jason Kipnis. So, <laughs> Brainier, Benassi, I'm glad you got that comp. Um, it opened my eyes to kind of put a little bit of a highlight on you, bud. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. like it. I like it. Yeah. So, once again, it's it, it's just a fun little formula that SDS has on their website, the historical comps. Um, you can smile at them. You can scoff at them. You can do whatever you want with them, but... I think they're fun. Yep, I'm with you. <laughs> with that, guys, um, that's what we have for you in tonight's podcast of STS, Bats and Stats. We'll see everybody soon. Mm -hmm.